Tonight on Project Exploitation. Down south, whenever anyone perpetrates some particularly monumental piece of foolishness, everybody says, send for Jesse Holmes. Jesse Holmes is the fool killer. Of course he is a myth, like Santa Claus and Jack Frost and general prosperity and all those concrete conceptions that are supposed to represent an idea that nature has failed to embody. The wisest of the Sotherons cannot tell you whence comes the fool killer's name. But few and happy are the households from the Roanoke to the Rio Grande in which the name of Jesse Holmes has not been pronounced or invoked. Always with a smile and often with a tear, he is summoned to his official duty. A busy man is Jesse Holmes. Everybody and welcome to Project Exploitation. My name is Nick Cheney, and with me is my dear, dear friend, my Rudolph, Dan Jeremy Brooks. Dan, how are you today? A very evil Christmas, and you'll have no New Year because you drove your van right off of a pier. Yeah, it's a shorter one this time. <laughs> <laughs> that is a shorter one. Uh, okay, what was what was the tune? Oh, it's uh, it was Heidi's idea actually. Uh, uh, John Lennon's uh, "Happy Xmas War Is Over." The oh. you know "Merry Merry Christmas" and "Happy." Okay, year. that's why so- I got confused because that's what I thought it was. But then for some weird reason, I thought it wasn't because that's already a Christmas song. Even though right. there's no reason why it can't be a Christmas song. So anyway, I I knew it, and then I talked myself out of it, is what I'm trying to say. So you should have trusted your instincts the first time. I should have. Uh, That's cool. And you know what? We're going to talk about a fella who should have trusted his instincts <laughs> uh, a little later. <laughs> um, because, of course, on today's episode, we are going to get into the holiday spirit by looking back at a classic 
Uh, of course, that movie is Christmas Evil, uh, directed and written by Lewis Jackson. Uh, just a little bit about uh, the movie itself uh, before we get into a discussion. Christmas Evil. Uh, originally, it was titled You Better Watch Out. That was Lewis Jackson's uh, title. It still is his title if you actually watch the print put out on disc by Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, but the studio itself, when marketing it, uh, changed it to Christmas Evil after the fact. But yeah, it is a 1980 thriller horror film uh, by Lewis Jackson. It stars Brandon Maggart as the main protagonist, uh, Harry Stadling. Rounding out the cast is Jeffrey DeMunn, uh, Diane Hall, Joe Jamrog, Ooh. Peter Newman, Mark Chamberlain, and a bunch of other people, including some random appearances by uh, Raymond J. Berry, and some other people we'll probably bring up a little later. So what we're going to do, as we uh, said in previous episodes, is that we have begun writing our own summaries for these movies. So I have taken the liberty to have written the summary for Christmas Evil. Some of these, I will say, before any of you uh, pedantic poo heads out there <laughs> get on my case, I did write this in a manner in which some of these events may not have happened in the movie sequentially, but it was easier to write it in the way I wrote it. So fuck you. So here we go. Uh, a summary for Christmas Evil. We open on Christmas Eve, 1947. Two young boys and their mother eagerly await an appearance from Santa Claus while sitting on their staircase. The boys, Harry and Philip, look on in awe as Santa Claus makes an appearance, complete with crawling out of the chimney and finding some solace in the Catholic ritual table laid out for him, where Santa can wash his hands in a basin and buff his shoes before munching on milk and cookies. When Philip starts to giggle, Santa looks back at him and weeks before absconding up the chimney into the night. Later that night, Harry gets upset with Philip, who points out that Santa looked an awful lot like their father. Unwilling to accept this possibility, Harry sneaks downstairs and is treated to Father Christmas, tickling Mommy's <laughs> inner thighs with his big white beard. Some traditions are best left a secret. <laughs> Harry runs up the stairs into the attic and sadly sits with a festive snow globe. As the images of what he's just witnessed flash through his mind, he throws the snow globe down on the ground, shattering it in pieces. Carefully, he picks up one of the shards of glass. Purposefully, he draws blood from his own hand with it. Cue the main title, You Better Watch Out. We move to the present, where a much older Harry is peacefully woken up by all things Christmas. A music box playing, snow on the ground, and the red tingly velvet Santa pajamas that he takes comfort in through many Yuletide nights rubbed up against his cherubic skin. <laughs> Harry is living alone, but surrounds himself with dolls of various kinds and other toys and Christmas memorabilia. He finds joy in the little things, like dancing around his house to Christmas music, and lathering himself up with excess shaving cream to take the shape of a Santa beard where none can grow. Santa is his unspoken idol, an idol whose identity he's slowly assimilating himself into. Another thing going unspoken is his routine surveillance of the neighborhood children. He spies on them with binoculars and makes meticulous notes on their good and bad deeds, all while updating their place in his very own naughty and nice tomes. By day, Harry works at a toy factory called Jolly Dream. While he once worked on the line, he's now been recently given a managerial position and is routinely belittled by his co-workers, who find him odd and off-putting, but easily manipulated. One of his co-workers even guilts him into taking a shift on the line for him after he catches Harry saying how much he misses working on the line. After being talked into taking the shift, Harry works both his day shift and his co-worker's night shift, only to find that the co-worker wasn't leaving for his trip until the next day and just wanted to go out drinking at the bar with the other workers. Harry overhears them at the bar laughing at Harry's gullibleness. We cut to Philip, who is taken after his father and has spawned two young boys and a healthy sexual appetite with his wife, Jackie. <laughs> the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade marches on television, while Jackie and Philip have a heart-to-heart -heart concerning Harry's deteriorating mental state. She pleads with Philip to not make things worse and go after Harry, since it's Thanksgiving today. Unfortunately, her compassion is not necessary because Harry calls Philip to inform him that he can't come over for turkey. There are too many children out there that need a Santa Claus, and Harry's just the guy to make it a reality. 
opting for a fake beard and a beat-up van in place of a sleigh, Harry starts his preparations. With Thanksgiving out of the way, Christmas time is here. Before attending his annual office Christmas party, he terrorizes one of the local children, whose biggest offense is sneaking a peek at Penthouse every once in a while. <laughs> at the party, the workers are introduced to a soulless act of charity as the company promises to donate toys to a hospital full of sick children, but can't seem to bother with any of the details, while also asking for the workers to come up with money from their own pockets to help cover it. Outraged, Harry steals toys from the factory and brings them to the hospital himself donning his newly fashioned Santa outfit, and for the first time in his life, feels the true joy of what it's like being the man in red. He then makes his way over to the midnight mass getting out on Christmas morning and attempts to meet with the factory owner on the steps of the church. Before meeting, however, a couple of people start accosting Harry and making light of his outfit and commitment to Christmas cheer. And with the help of a toy soldier, Harry commits his, presumably, first murder and then some. He flees the scene, his Christmas spirit short-lived as he is now a criminal on the run. Detectives trail behind the bodies that Harry leaves behind, including his asshole co-worker, whom he smothers with his great big bag of toys. <laughs> Amidst all this chaos, though, he is still able to find a respite, being welcomed into a family Christmas party, where he is celebrated and respected by both adults and children alike, who haven't lost the Christmas spirit. Meanwhile, Philip laments Harry's behavior and his strange absence from the festivities on Christmas morning, something that Harry would never miss. He finally gets a call from Harry late in the day when Harry tells Philip not to worry about him, and that he's finally found the right note and he can play the tune that everybody else plays. The conversation ends abruptly as Harry runs out into the night once again. Harry is chased around town in a Frankenstein-like manner, and when he is trapped in a dead-end alley, only the children save him from the adults the children who still believe in good and Santa Claus, Harry is able to briefly escape, long enough to find himself on Philip's doorstep. After a tense exchange, Philip, recognizing right away that Harry is the person responsible for the recent murders, spirals into a blind rage and chokes Harry out to the brink of death. But it's Christmas, and miracles do happen. <laughs> Harry regains consciousness and speeds away in his dirty white van, leaving the town mob on the ground in the front lawn as he takes flight and heads back to the North Pole in his mind. Merry Christmas, everyone. Oh, that was nice. Well, thank you. Yeah, very good. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that last sentence, mm -hmm. obviously. I had to write it one way or the other. It's hard to write. Mm -hmm. And then something ambiguous happens. Um, <laughs> right. Yes, yes. Uh, well, apparently, uh, apparently the director, Lewis Jackson, said that people in particular really hated the ending. Like, uh, 40, uh, you know, they showed it on 42nd Street, you know, the deuce, if you will. Yeah. Um, and people were like pelting the screen with crap. They were just like, no, no, I hate the, you know, and John Waters, who is a big fan of this movie, as we will discuss in a second, says, well, yes, uh, exploitation audiences have always had a trouble with surrealism or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, or yeah. even just sentimentality. True. You know, I mean, depending on how you read that. I mean, it's surreal in its literal sense, but also uh, the meaning behind the image is either something far more sinister or something far more uh, possibly compassionate. <laughs> Uh, yes. than, than we were expecting. And I think both of those can be, uh, well, one of them in particular can be off putting, I think, to, uh, a certain section of the exploitation crowd. But yeah. we'll get to that ending in due time. Um, why don't we start off with our general thoughts and impressions? Uh, Dan, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I would love to because um, I have some things I kind of learned about the background. Um, okay, great. Uh, so, a <laughs> few things. What I learned during my Christmas vacation. So, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, the as I used to always have to do when you came back to school after. Uh, so, apparently, Lewis Jackson, he, a writer director, as you said, uh, he said he got the money because people thought he was going to make a slasher movie, and Halloween had just come out fairly recently. And he's like, I never had any intention of doing it. He's like, I was totally wrapped up in like Fastbender at the time. So, so he was going to make an art film or what do you call a foreign film? But almost immediately things went south. I mean, it's, you know the story. You, you hear these things so often when we talk about exploitation films, particularly ones that are ignored when they first came out. I mean, this one is like, you know, he should have known things were going bad right off the bat because at one of the early screenings, this Warner Brothers executive tells him like, hey, you know, you're going to have a hit on your hands. You're going to have a huge hit, but you got to do one thing. You got to have a scene of Harry 
eating one of the fingers he chops off. And it's like, uh, that's a terrible, terrible idea. Plus, we've wrapped shooting, so I don't know how we're going to, you know. And, and, you know, and then, the, like you said, there's the last minute title change. Like, he didn't even know about that till he got the poster in the mail. Uh, the West Coast ad campaign got scuttled by the MPAA. I, I don't know exactly what it was in particular they thought it was so onerous to them. But, I mean, basically, the guy in the West Coast... All of SoCal, he was going to do. So he had this entire print campaign. He had printed all this stuff, and he had sunk so much money in that he couldn't go back and do it again. So basically, the ad campaign was almost non-existent on the West Coast. Like I said, you know, the 42nd Street moviegoers pelting the screen. You've got near universal bad reviews, little distribution. And basically, Jackson was just so demoralized, he quit the business, and he hasn't made a movie since. But, <clears throat> as promised, I was going to say, uh, then a blessed Christmas miracle occurs, and John Waters to the rescue. Yes, John Waters, that John Waters. In the mid-80s, he writes this book, Crackpot, which is like something he'll update and republish every few years. It's very entertaining. And um, he writes a whole chapter about his favorite time of year, which is Christmas, and his favorite movie of Christmas, which is Christmas Evil, which at the time, I don't know if it was even really available to rent, or it was not an easy movie to find. I was going to say, it strikes me as something he would have been able to find because he had access to those kind of things, like reels and whatnot. Totally, yeah. Because he says, <laughs> quote the John Waters, I wish I had kids, I'd make them watch it every year, and if they didn't like it, they'd be punished. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm with him. I agree. And he's like a bona fide Yuletide fiend, right? Like you and I love Christmas, but we don't, we don't love Christmas like he loves Christmas. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not going to go. I mean, he starts celebrating before Halloween. He says he dresses up as the little drummer boy for Halloween. <laughs> And I'm not going to go into the whole ritualized, uh, you know, elaborate, all the celebrations yeah, he no does. I wonder if this movie spoke to him. Oh, yeah. It, this was just like, it was as if it was tailor made for John Waters, you know? And okay, I'll just tell you one story he tells, which is just incredible. His grandmother once toppled over her Christmas tree and was pinned under it for several hours. Finally rescued when the family showed up for the, you know, the festivities. And he's, I just have a little quote here. He's like, that awful pause before my parents rushed to free her. My own stunned silence as I dared not ask if granny's gifts to us had been damaged. <laughs> uh, he's like, this tableau was never mentioned again. And my family pretended it never happened. But I remember, boy, do I remember. <laughs> I, I that know is, it's that's amazing it is yeah <laughs> you know? anyway so basically according to jackson uh waters basically single-handedly saved this movie and it kind of gave him a shot in the arm he ended up spending like three years tracking down uh all the different bogus versions the bootlegs and stuff and um basically he would he would threaten to sue people so they would take their versions off the market Including Troma. Apparently, there's no love loss there. I guess Troma, uh, schnookered him, he says. And so now anyway, he, the, the, the good news is at the end, he now owns the exclusive rights to it. And it's, again, it's back to being titled, You Better Watch Out. And as a side note, it turns out John Waters is a huge fan of Fassbinder too. Uh, he says, uh, quote, anybody who idolizes Douglas Sirk is A-OK -okay in my book. So there you go. Yeah. So that's kind of what I, that's what I learned. Uh, uh, during my Christmas vacation, yeah. Mm. Well, good. You do the learning, so that way I don't have to. <laughs> that could be a slogan. Yeah, there you go. I, but I, I, I mean, you know, just opening thoughts. I absolutely loved the flick. Um, I had not seen it before, and I know it's one of your favorites. Not just one of your favorite Christmas films or Christmas horror films, but just one of your favorite movies in general. And so I went into it with a certain amount of expectation, um, and and it really was quite good. And it's obvious that Lewis Jackson, this was a big thing for him. I mean, it, he storyboarded like every scene, he said. I mean, it's, it's this was a huge labor of love. He worked on the script off and on for almost like 10 years. I mean, it's, so you can see how demoralizing it would be to put out a movie. And, and then it's like, okay, wow, I spent all this time and all this, put all this care. And then, but definitely it's, it's clearly a movie about sort of um, commercialism and Coca-Cola, you know, the, the, the Santa Claus that, is inherently the creature of, of capitalism. 
And I say this is, I mean, you and I are big fans of Christmas. I mean, we both, you know, I mean, right now you've got your Christmas tree up right next to your television screen. I mean, it, it looks awesome. I always love it every year. Goes up November 1st. That's right. That's right. Because it comes down from the attic. One and day then... after uh, John Waters. <laughs> Yes, that's true. But still, there is, there's always that, that, uh, acrid, uh, taste of, um, you know, shilling the rubes, if you will, underneath the mythology. Uh, you know, Jackson talked about, he said he got a lot of abuse. After the film came out, a lot of people thought he was criticizing Christmas. And he's like, I'm not criticizing Christmas. He's like, I actually, he, he basically feels very deeply about it. He was, uh, disturbed, and this is back in 1980, at the, the increasing commercialization of it. And he says, you know, this is Santa Claus, as we know him, is essentially a creation of Coca-Cola and Thomas Nast and, and that stuff. And then later, you know, Rockwell, Norman Rockwell, of course. But I think that Cold Open really very neatly summarizes that whole uh, Rockwell versus reality push and pull. Because in just a couple minutes, I mean, it's very... You know, you have this initial moment of really priceless magic, and then it suddenly exploded <laughs> by reality. I and mean, I shouldn't laugh or carnality. I guess it's really, it's just, you know, and of course, the subject to um, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus, which I very much misunderstood as a kid. Um, and I'm as an adult, it took me far, far too long belatedly to finally understand the meaning punchline. And I'm not really proud of that fact, so I don't even know why I'm bringing it up. But it's so this is like sort of like the nightmare scenario of I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. And uh, but what you said about the father is interesting because he's like the cleanliness of of him coming down the chimney. And then, you know, he's like you said, he's washing his hands and he's, you know, he's dusting the boots. And it almost feels like uh, this guy. Uh, well, he's a he was a real person, but he was he's a character in this uh, musical fun home. Uh, that came out. Uh, Alison Bechtel uh, wrote it. And he, this guy, uh, her father, Bruce Bechtel, is just at times monstrous and, and monstrously tortured because uh, he's got this obsessive compulsive. And I wondered in some ways if we're seeing at the very beginning, again, you know, how the, the, the very cold open is such a great encapsulation of all the themes. I wonder if in a way we're kind of seeing some of the inherited possibly psychological issues Harry's got later. I mean, you see like, after his, you know, Christmas Eve spree, the next morning, he's really paying all this attention to the Santa suit, you know, cleaning it up, even though, of course, it's, it's hopelessly dirty at that point. So anyway, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating opening. And, and of course, there's that whole mesmeric, um, pantomime that the father does. And it's, it's so, I, 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 I don't even know. It, it's tableau like, I guess. And it's interesting. He's, he's studiously ignoring the, the mother and the kids, uh, until, of course, he does the little wink with the nose thing. But, and they're, of course, behind the, the stairs, the banister. In a way, it's like you see them through the, um, spindles and it's like Harry's entrapped already from the word go. It's like when we first see him, he's already sort of quote behind bars. And, well, and also I should also say just, you know, really fast, any father who can actually come down a chimney, uh, I, I feel I would be remiss if I did not say that any father who can do that should be given the ultimate hall pass for seducing his wife in the Santa Claus outfit thing later, because that's incredible. Well, I will say that's incredible, but actually, I'll go one point further and say any father who can go back up the chimney <laughs> is, uh, I mean, I don't know if he put like a ladder uh installed or something but because when he when he plops down i just picture well maybe he's doing the whole like uh you know feet on each side or whatever right. but for him to then uh somehow disappear i'm like the, the logistics of that yeah yeah it's like a pneumatic tube he just right, right you know like you know when you're at the bank or something uh I, I i have no idea how he does it so yeah so that intro is is that rockwell versus reality thing perfectly summarized and then the rest of the film you know jackson just kind of keeps laying on all those contrasts because you've got you know the ideal of christmas you know jackson in one of the commentaries he calls it the generosity of spirit you know versus uh the economic reality of how we in america celebrate it and never before or since as far as i know has the macy's shop windows with their you know worrying automata <laughs> and uh the the gears the screeching gears never have they been so satanic in a movie <laughs> i mean it's absolutely 
uh, unsettling. Yeah, it's very mechanical. It's almost like a, a, a dire version of like a Jacques Tati tableau where yes. it looks very precise, but precise in a almost like evil and overbearing way. Yes, yes. The Tati thing is, I think you're absolutely right. It is. It's very precise, but not in a charming way like a Tati film is where it's like, oh, everything came together perfectly. It's like, you know, where you 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 marvel at the um, ingenuity and, and the you know, kind of Swiss watch accuracy. And this, it's more like, wow, this is so mercenary. It's just like, yeah, kids, come throw your damn money at us. And, and the same thing with the Macy's parade. Um, it's simultaneously, I think the parade, n- not just in the movie, but just in general, I think the Macy's parade is simultaneously one of the more heartwarming parts of Christmas and one of the most obviously commercialized and mercenary parts about American Christmas. And I, I love that way that Harry just sits up straighter in that riveted anticipation when, you know, Santa's arrival and it has that, that it's, it's like a combination of guilelessness and menace too, because the, the music cues us to that. And it, yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it reminded me of this really brilliant, uh, SNL sketch from a few years ago with Ryan Gosling called Santa Baby. Yeah. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. It's brilliant. It it's and it's one of those where it starts out and it's kind of funny, and then as it goes, you're like, "This is really creepy." Because it's basically this couple who are new in town. They're invited to the Christmas party in the neighborhood, and very quickly you realize they're just cracked psychotics, and they believe Santa's real, and they get a little violent, and there's this weird erotic component to them that's really inappropriate, and everybody is really creeped out and. You know, so I, I got that same kind of creepy vibe, especially I think because the fact that we're hearing um, Harry and Philip on the phone and they're, the TVs are on simultaneously in both houses. And so they're drowning out the dialogue <laughs> on both sides. And of course, we see that later because Philip's like, turn on that fucking TV, you know, later on in the uh, movie. And it's just that unsettling feeling that maybe is best shown in the scene where right right after uh and i shouldn't laugh about this but right after harry has uh killed uh frank you know with the sack and the kids come out and he's giggling with them and it's like it's that brief moment where they're like oh santa claus and they're they're about to find out in in a few seconds that he just murdered their dad and you're watching them like at that last moment of kind of giggly innocence you know and i felt that kind of tension through the whole movie and i think that is intentional because it has to do with that again like i said rockwell uh versus reality you might say i mean that's just for this kind of stuff that i clued into immediately which is very I, i think very clearly i was intended to oh absolutely uh well uh first off i'm glad you like this movie uh as you alluded to i obviously am a huge fan of this movie i I think it's fantastic i've watched it uh, five or six times now ever since i discovered it uh, you know four or five years ago um try to watch it every year now um you know as you mentioned uh we we here at project exploitation uh are big big fans of christmas and Honestly, not that I'm speaking for you, but I think between the two of us for, uh, I'm sure some similar reasons, but also for completely different reasons. Uh, you know, I myself, uh, am an atheist. Uh, mm. Dan, uh, you are a believer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm more of a, okay. a, a believer. You I, know? I didn't mean to just pin you as, as one thing or what. No, uh, I, uh, I meant that I'm into Justin Bieber. I'm, I'm a believer. Oh. God damn it. Damn. Sorry. I'll, I'll joke it aside. I would say, um, I am, I, I, I hate to call myself a Christian because I feel like I'm insulting to people who actually follow Christ's teachings. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I'm not able to in some, some fundamental ways. Unfortunately, it's not out of lack of faith, but, uh, masturbation is important. We get it. <sighs> it's true. It's true. Yes. I have, I have a lot of, I have a lot of hate in my heart too, for certain. That, well, that is yeah. for sure. We'll get into that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At Another some point on the podcast. Right. 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 Um, so. but just to, I mean, just to point out superficially that, you know, you and I have, uh, differences between us and yet we both, uh, really get into this time of year um and and i think that's for me growing up uh in a 
Catholic household. Uh, that's what I find so striking about this movie is that, you know, Christmas can be two things at once. It can be something that is overly uh, crass and commercialized by uh, a capitalistic society and even co-opted by religion too, mm, uh, religious organizations. Obviously, it can have its ties into it, but it can still be overbearing in the way that the importance on it uh, can get slightly can, can can blind people to the actual message behind it. You know, it's um, it's more important that you show up to church on midnight mass than <laughs> it is you actually be good three hundred sixty four days of the of the year yes, uh, yes. and whatnot. So you know, n- nobody is entirely in the right when it comes to uh, this holiday, and and nobody is entirely in the wrong, um, but. As a person who grew up in a Catholic household, who then uh, uh, annexed himself away <laughs> from his family's bloodline of Catholics, uh, <laughs> um, Christmas has meant something different to me at different stages in my life, but has always been constantly a huge presence and something that I enjoy. And when I say I enjoy it, I mean the time of the year, uh, the, I don't know, mental serotonin <laughs> that, you know, for some reason does get, uh, you know, flushed around in my brain, uh, you know, around this time of year. And yeah, the act of gift giving and receiving um, and, and just finding an excuse to hang out uh, during some of the coldest days of the year. Uh, all of that like you're saying Rockwell mm. uh shit I I'm 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 all here for it. It is very mm. much my bag of toys and <laughs> um but it's still kind of a complicated one. It's still something that I you know, some days I feel weirdly guilty for enjoying it and then other days I'm like that's stupid because it is stupid. You know, I mean like it's just it's it's never going to be I I'll say this, Christmas is never going to be an easy thing. Mm. For, I think, myself and really probably for any adult. I mean, you know, any adult who lives through uh, grief, who lives through Mm. happy times and bad times and whatnot, uh, Christmas cannot pass without some kind of colorization of your past, uh, you know, present and future. Obviously, that's why Dickens wrote the story. (laughs) Um, But true. Yeah. And so I, I just find it to be a, a wonderful time of the year, um, but also one of the strangest and <laughs> um, and that and and endlessly fascinating. So that's that's my preamble of you know uh, myself and and the holiday. And I think that's what Christmas Evil, or you better watch out, uh, gets so right. This is I don't think of Harry as a bad guy in this movie. I, I obviously. There, there are bad things that are done, but it really does stem from both uh, nature and nurture. Um, part of it is, you know, what happened around him, whether it's the, uh, you know, the unfortunate viewing of the Christmas sexcapades between his parents, <laughs> um, but also living in a society that does crassly co-opt Christmas and turn it into a joke. And yet, like, as a kid... <laughs> That's always the weirdest thing about Christmas, I think, when you're a kid, is that when you're a kid, 99% of the time, uh, not always, but most kids, especially in America, (laughs) are taught two fundamental truths when they're young. Mm. God is real and Santa is real. Right. And then at some point, that kid gets to talk that one of them isn't. (laughs) Yes. And that is a weird talk to have because it believes in everything, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, okay, so this isn't, but this is, and we're all okay with that, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. And it starts to pervade your every waking thought and, and, you know, your, uh, what you thought was, you know, your moral compass and, and whatnot. And, and that is, it's, it's almost too much. I think of a burden, not to say don't tell your kids that Santa's real. Like, no, I'm saying like, sure. I, I, I believe in the tradition. I think it's a great time. I mean, if kids can believe in magic, which most do, mm. uh, why, who are we to, you know, step, step in the way of that. But, um, I don't think we examine at 
at large the weird psychological effects that that can have on anybody growing up. Um, and while I don't think we all turn out to be murderers uh, because of it. <laughs> well, um, hey, speak for yourself, buddy. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I won't speak for Dan. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do think that this movie gets that completely right when it, with regards to the weird cognitive dissonance that we can experience as we grow up when we have that rug pulled out from underneath us. And what I think some reviews that I've read, like on Letterboxd or other places, I think one thing that reviews sort of missed the point of, for me at least, uh, is the opening scene when he sees his mom and dad. And I, this movie is in no way psychosexual. Like, yeah. there is nothing about Harry that is stemming from that moment in a sexual manner. At least in my interpretation, I don't find any of this to be... Like, I, I think of Harry as asexual. Like, Definitely. I don't think of him as actually wanting to have sex or having desires to have sex because he is too preoccupied with this mythos, you know? Right. And I'm not saying it didn't stem possibly from that moment, but I don't think that the movie itself is trying to do the um, I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus origin story Um, right i think it's more of a loss of innocence in general and the struggle to keep that image alive in your head when you grow up and you find out that your parents are actually valuable and that quote unquote there is no santa claus and 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 so on and so forth and what you will do to hang on for dear life to something that was actually given to you to comfort you mm. and what what happens when you're not allowed to have that anymore there's there's a whole host of other things in that scene too like the fact that philip the younger brother starts to giggle because he gets it yes before harry does you know like he and he's not a, he's not mad about it either like he giggles cuz he kind of catches on that that's his father but as the older brother harry is almost kind of embarrassed and ashamed that you know, his younger brother caught on to it. Evan is trying to convince him of it. And and I think that is a lot to do with how, where they are in their adult relationship as, as siblings that I'm sure we'll get into. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I think this movie is kind of astounding. I, I think it really taps into a part of Christmas that no other movie I've ever seen ever uh, tapped into, let alone seceded. Like, it's not just an attempt. I think it's a genuine uh, success. Yeah. There's just, there, there's so many great things about it. I think the biggest thing that works for this movie is uh, Brandon Maggart as Harry. Um, he is not playing this as a horror movie. Um, mostly because it's not a horror movie. Like, there is a few moments for sure of uh, kind of macabre and thrilling, uh, you know, horrific images like the eye gouging. and uh, But there's not that many murders. Like, there's the murderers on the church steps, and then there's like two more. So, like, it, it doesn't take up too much running time compared to Harry just trying to hold on to his own sanity, which is not a horror film. That's just real life. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think Brendan Maggart lends an actual credible naivete and, but also joy to uh, the, the world of Harry. And, you know, I mean, when he walks down the sidewalk uh, and he sees the kid, the way he yells to them is this weird put upon voice because he's like hi guy like it's almost peewee herman-esque you know (laughs) where he's trying to quite literally meet them at their level in a way adults don't ever do because you don't want to embarrass yourself when you like you know when when you become an adult it's when you learn shame right yeah and when you when you have that then you you kind of lose almost all ability to connect with children like at their level Mm -hmm. like even the best adults like who are great with children to some even some of them are still technically talking down to them yeah. in a friendly but a kind of like well you'll you know one day you'll be like me type thing or whatever but harry maybe because he never got there or maybe because he did and he didn't like it and and he's able to tap back into it harry sees children as vessels i guess of pure unadulterated joy and 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 innocence and the way he goes about trying to preserve that is actually very moving um 
in, in a very bizarre way. So, um, sure. And uh, I think I'll end my opening thoughts by just saying that I, I think there's so much to unpack, but I, I hesitate calling it a horror film. I think in general it's a Christmas drama, uh, but it's one that takes the melancholy of the loss of innocence that I feel like so many adults struggle with uh, deadly seriously. Sure. And that's why we sometimes uh, mistake it for a horror film. But God, where do we start? I mean, I think one thing um, that I very much enjoy when watching this movie is all the scenes and kind of everything surrounding uh, Jolly Dream, the, the toy factory that he works at. Cause the actual set for Jolly Dream has a lot of weird choices uh, in its staging and blocking. Um, one of them being that the sunlight, like this is a, a factory that does not, that allows the sun to come blaring through. Because a lot of times you, I think factories, like I always think of them as being like oppressively dark, you know, almost like. Uh, like how they do casinos where they don't want you to be conscious <laughs> yes. of what time of the day it is, you know, yes. so that way you're just focused on your job. But the fact that all this kind of capitalistic excess and greed just happens quite literally under the harsh light of day, uh, I think it's a very deliberate choice in when they were maybe scouting this location out and whatnot. Uh, Dan, what did you think about uh, Jolly Dream, uh, either the company or the personnel? Jolly Dream is, you know, a place that is neither jolly nor anyone's idea of a dream, obviously. And <laughs> yeah. uh, interestingly, um, it was an actual toy factory. I found out the uh, producer, uh, Pressman, um, but he owned, a, but they had to create different toys for it because he wasn't going to use their own for because of the possibly negative connotations. <laughs> <laughs> what? I know. Like, well, there's no such thing as bad publicity, dude. <laughs> so it is interesting in a way that that place it was actually laid out that way and it did have the windows where they were and it's very oddly sparse and weird um yes very sparse yeah it's a strange thing the way that um you know you usually you think of these kind of places especially i think in a in a christmas structure you would think that this would be almost trying to mirror uh shall we say santa's workshop as like a funny ironic commentary right when in reality this seems like the furthest thing from it uh there is like barely anybody here it seems like the factory itself is almost struggling to stay afloat not by any line of dialogue that's given but just by the set dressing and the fact that everything is so minimized um i, I love that the workers uh, when they're having their break, uh, they, they make references to the fact that they're, you know, they're in a union mm. and they actually chastise Harry for not showing up, which is so weird because that's another detail that I feel like a movie like this gets weirdly right, where I think it would have been easy to pretend like Harry would be bad at his job, mm. you know, so to speak. Like he would just be like a bumbling, like too, too, too much of a head in the clouds type of character. Like, no, everybody doesn't like him because he takes it too seriously. And even when he's talking like at lunch on lunch break to them, all he wants to do is talk about, uh, you know, the toys and how it could be done better and not in a militant way, but in this very weird, uh, high minded, noble <laughs> way. And, you know, all of these guys are just trying to eat their turkey sandwiches and, and get on with their day uh, it's such a weird juxtaposition oh yeah it is and uh i mean brandon maggart's uh, performance you're right is so good i mean he he's relatively young but his eyes he already looks ancient you know he's got a little like harry dean stanton a little uh pruitt taylor vince uh a little a little Polly shore and maybe a dash of jack nance a little jack nance and he, he, the way he shows that mental decay, he, you know, the movie shows don't tells, if you will. And it almost comes entirely from mostly wordless stuff that Maggart does. Um, and some of it would almost be funny if it wasn't, you know, cause it's almost, some of it's almost physical comedy. It would be funny if it wasn't so disquietly intense, <laughs> you know? And then the other thing is you're right about, there aren't many movies that I can think of that really talk about this way that we sort of have this systematic and structural way of 
building kids up in make believe and then uh sort of um disabusing them of the illusion. It is a strange thing. I mean, the only movie I can really think of that even talks about it very much is, you know, Miracle on 34th Street, because you have um a Natalie Woods character, the little girl. I can't remember the name of the um actress who plays her mom. But of course that movie's all about getting belief as opposed to losing belief very much about like uh, putting flesh to Santa Claus as opposed to stripping away the illusion. And I, I think in a way that's what partly like you were saying, what makes Harry so sympathetic and so tragic is that it's like, yeah, I mean, he just takes it really seriously. It's like when you imbue people at a young age with certain values and they take it totally seriously in later on in life it's like well we can't really blame them for that you know it's like imbuing somebody with a really really strong sense of fair play and justice uh and then kind of being like well that's life and you're like wait a minute now no 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 so if somebody takes it really seriously like that like uh there's this archetype well i'll talk about it later it's called the fool killer and it's the idea of the guy who's like will kill bad people justice rough justice if you will so I think in a way, Harry, I think the lowest moment for him in the movie is not like when he's being made fun of or they're, you know, or whatever he's disrespected, but it's when he's trying to climb down Frank's chimney. And, you know, we just see him running up against the coldest kind of physical reality. And it, it happened, you know, he almost gets stuck. In the midst of this play acting that he's obviously been craving his whole life, you can almost see like the dashed fantasies in this floating behind his eyes in his face, you know, and it's not just that it's a pathetic spectacle, but he's physical agony, you know, he's he's trying to get back out. And it's like this whole minutes of the film where the pace is totally derailed by this terrible uh humiliation that he's suffering and it perfectly crystallizes again that rockville versus reality thing i think that to me is the the saddest part for harry because it, it it's like running up against a brick wall <laughs> <laughs> well and i think you're absolutely right especially because of the fact that in that sequence he is completely alone you know right. it's not a humiliation that happens socially uh which many do in this movie sure. uh, but this is one in which only he and himself are left in this moment to try to prop up the uh disillusionment and it is slowly crumbling in front of his own eyes yeah. because even he can't quite uh you know fit uh into this dream that he had envisioned yeah that's exactly right that's the perfect way to say it he can't fit <laughs> you know and and throughout the movie we get you know, we get definitely ideas of his thought process in general. Um, there's another glimpse, uh, during the first Christmas party, the office party. I mean, the, the, the awful one yeah. where he introduces this whole compelling metaphor of like the tune they're playing. Yeah. Which is so interesting. And I, I mean, there's several things you could, he can mean by it. I mean, I, I know in one of the commentaries, uh, Lewis Jackson says, eh, you know, it's just a metaphor. It's, it's like, it's like slang, like, Oh, I got played or something. He says it could mean that. But the thing is, is music and, and especially carols are so essential to him to calm him down, to cope with to the point where it's like a crutch at times. Yeah. He'll literally kind of, uh, moan some out yeah. uh, when he's in some of his most physical agony. I thought that was a great character detail. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. And it, and it, and so that line, even though it feels very odd uh, and, and it's hard to explain, it, it feels just right when you've seen him dealing with humiliation and that and and humming like you said these these things to himself but he also allows himself to even be guided by music like that scene where right after he's committed the first three murders and he's in the van and he hears the saxophone and it kind of like draws it like rouses him from out of the van and then there he gets into like you said in the summary he goes to that party and it's it's like that lovely thoroughly super rockwellian party where like the kids are asleep on top of the piles of coats it's just so picturesque and beautiful and and it's it's not it doesn't feel um treacly though it feels just like yeah this is a part of christmas too we forget you know it, it's not all commercialized some of it is is really just because people enjoy each other's company and this is an excuse to get together with your kith and kin if you will yeah so i mean in that scene too when you're watching it obviously it's in the back of your mind but 
it doesn't feel like a horror scene in which, like, oh, you're like, okay, a murderer's in the room. They don't know it. Right. When you're watching that scene, the tone of the scene is Santa is there for one night only, yes. you know, and, and he, quote unquote, steps on the stage and, and knocks it out of the park, which is such a weirdly uplifting high, <laughs> uh, considering the events, you know, preceding, and then, of course, the, the events that come after. Oh, I know. It is. It's such a wonderful scene. And, well, of course, I love Mark Margolis is in it, you know, uh, a.k.a. Uh, Salamanca from Breaking Bad. I mean, he's been in a ton of things, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think you do when he talks about like music or, or, or that kind of thing, it's like whatever he means by it, it does help shade in, at least for me, the extent of what Harry's inner life, how much of it is based on uh, symbolism and unreality, I guess. You know, it almost reminded me in some ways of um, the two protagonists from Peter Jackson's uh, No Relation, by the way, uh, Heavenly Creatures, where they live in this incredibly, they constructed this very dense and complex fantasy world that they escape into and more and more as the film progresses to the point where... Is that the Melanie Linsky and mm -hmm. um, who's the other person? Kate, Kate Winslet. Kate, yeah. Yes, yes. I've actually never seen that, uh, like, start to finish. I've definitely caught it in moments for some random reason, but oh, anyway, I've always meant to, but yeah. It's it's wonderful, really, and it's and it manages to balance that wonderment and escape with real f fear and menace and dread uh but it reminded me uh, it felt a bit like that because harry in a way he's not just in, in the same way that those that melanie linsky and kate winslet are like that in heavenly creatures harry's not just like using analogies i think he lives or at least wants to live or at least feels most comfortable in a world of analogy and symbolism. And I think it makes sense to him. And it also feels like firm, like moral ground to him. And I, I think there's a part again, in one of the commentaries where Lewis Jackson says that part of the movie, the point was it had to do with the idea that no man can embody a myth, especially uh, one, somebody who has supernatural powers like Santa. So I think he takes these symbols so seriously and he chooses to live within them as much as he can. So, I mean, imagine how offensive <laughs> His work environment must be like you're saying about Jolly Dream. You have the elven uniforms, the assembly lines and that piped in music. And oh, it's just horrid. You know, reminded me of this great line from a, a James McMurtry song called Candyland, incidentally, um, not a Christmas song. But he says, uh, he says oh, here's the line here. I have it here. Uh, Cats on fire chasing after the ice cream van. Man, that circus music's got to be hell on the ice cream man. <laughs> you know, the, idea that the music should not da, 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 da. In fact, there's this great thing in this movie, Comfort and Joy, which maybe this year we'll watch it because I've been wanting to watch this with you and it's a great Christmas movie, but there's a whole thing about um ice cream trucks and the music and the repetition of it and you know, but anyway. So I, I, I don't think he's like arrested Harry's arrested maturity wise exactly. Uh, I mean he kind of is. But I, I just, I think it's, it, it, I would say that almost there's a part of him that's still in that cage of the spindles, the made out of shadows, you know, at the foot of the stairs. Like there's, he's in jail, you know, like when, you know, when you're a kid and you play pretend, you're like, oh, I'm in jail. You know, I think in a way he's uh, emotionally, developmentally at that point almost. Right. And also, if you look at it from Harry's point of view, which obviously that's an exercise in uh, empathy and whatnot, is why would he why would he have to be the one to give up what he believes in mm -hmm. when is everybody else that is being bad and, and greedy and whatnot? You know, it's it's almost like he's the victim now. That's. I'm saying that lightly in the sense that that's how he sees himself because unfortunately he's too far gone in the symbol and into the lore. Right. But it, it, it brings up a, a good point as to, well, yeah, like, you know, this is what brings him joy. And if he's not hurting people in, you know, the first half or so now, uh, I do want to stress that I don't think uh, stalking children is okay or <laughs> or any of those things, but it's easy to see why a person who is so indebted to wanting to do good and be good and make the world, quote unquote, better, uh, particularly with regarding children, it, it strikes me as something where I think one thing that Christmas Evil is kind of a black comedy about um, is that. The lore of Santa Claus is insane. 
<laughs> like, <laughs> if you actually pick it apart, I don't mean like the logistics of the magic or anything like that, mm. but just the image of this man and his quote unquote relationship with children. It is very much this weird, I would say almost like, right wing conservative uh purity test where <laughs> the very people who get off on like creating this man in the eyes of children would also fucking hate him in person. Oh yeah, like, totally. You know what I mean? And and it, so it's and obviously the movie goes all in on that because the, you know it literally climaxes with uh like I alluded to earlier with the Frankenstein like mob uh where you know uh, pitchforks and torches uh, <laughs> almost quite literally come out, and, and and that's absolutely true. Though it's it's very much this thing where it's like adults push this on children, despite the fact that if this was real, that they would be the first ones to find this to be creepy, disgusting, and downright quote unquote evil, even if they weren't out murdering people or anything like that. And I find that weird. I find that dictatomy to be to be fascinating oh it totally is you know it reminds me of this um song by woody guthrie uh called jesus christ where he says uh you know if jesus christ preached how he did in jerusalem if he preached that way in new york they would lay jesus christ in his grave yeah and it's true it's like the same people who uh, like you said very much idolize uh santa claus the values of santa claus and and, and also christ it's like that kind of altruism in reality is just uh, odious to them. They cannot stand that thought. It's it's like the Mister Rogers uh, conundrum, you know, where yes, he was so good and so good at what he did that then people had to start thinking is, and I say people as in bad, annoying people had to then start questioning: Is he a pedophile? Is he gay? Like right. things that have nothing to do with who he was and and what he did. But the moment you basically make anyone feel like shit because of how good you are yes. <laughs> is the moment you try to start picking apart somebody's goodness and uh, inserting things that either A, have nothing to do with uh, what they're presenting, or B, uh, looking for the worst of what it could represent with no actual empirical evidence. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You, you you put somebody on a pedestal and then you're like, yeah, let's, I really fucking hate this guy. You know, and, and I, I don't. Hey, how'd you get up there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come down from there. Right, exactly. I think, I think we're not conscious of it, but we're really like, who really, I really like seeing that guy get knocked down, you know? And I think also, of course, like you said, the Santa Claus myth is very asexual in its own way. I mean, I know he has Mrs. Claus, but we don't think about them having a sexual life you know what i mean at all and no. and, and it's the same. they're not allowed no not at all i mean it's much like our parents you know it's the same idea and they're not allowed either well exactly and if you're listening <laughs> stop yes you you know you're doing wrong so just knock it off people so no uh <laughs> but it's true it's like so so the santa claus myth is very i don't think it's psychosexual in the movie um it's it's just because santa's not I think Harry's Harry has that fracture, you know, that beautiful moment with the snow globe being smashed. Um, and that shot, by the way, is so superb of, of child Harry in the snow globe. When he first walks into the attic and it's in the foreground, yeah. he's in the background. It's just so good. It's so good. I think it must probably be two images stitched together. It's a, it gives the illusion of deep focus. So in a sense, it's kind of funny because you get both the snow globe and deep focus, which are two yeah. allusions to Citizen Kane right off the bat. Because I think of Citizen Kane is one of the oh, yeah. original deep focus. Was, yeah. So, and, and of course, there's a beautiful um, visual rhyme later. I'm getting off the subject here, but there's a visual rhyme later with the uh, gumball machines falling off the conveyor belt and smashing. Yeah. Later on, I was like, oh, that's really clever. Yes. That parallel is, is so good. And I actually don't think you're... I mean, because we see, what do we see in this movie? We see Laurel and Hardy at one point, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. It's um, um, uh, babe, Babes in Toyland. Babes in Toyland, yeah. And I know we see another classic, but I forget what. So I think this movie is quite uh, conscious of cinema history before it. And the idea that this does open with a kid, a formative childhood experience, and a snow globe, I don't think that's the accidental vis-a-vis uh, mm -hmm. -vis, uh, Citizen Kane in general. So, yeah, I, I didn't think about that, but I, I, I think that's spot on. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I, I know, I mean, again, I've read a lot about it in the last few weeks, and I know Lewis Jackson 
was very influenced. I mean, he says at the end is very Frankenstein, you know, James Whale's Frankenstein and uh, Fritz Lang's M. He's like, I'm, I'm thefting directly from it intentionally here. But yeah, I mean, that snow globe, I think in a way, Harry just wants to live in that snow globe before it was smashed, if you will. Yeah. And it's like, the, there are a couple occasions. And I think this is part of what makes the movie so great. It isn't unrelentingly grim. There's a couple occasions where he, things come together really perfectly, albeit briefly, of course, like that there's that enchanting, and really I use the word enchanting intentionally. I mean, there's that enchanting moment outside of the, um, let's see, Willow Springs, uh, the, the children's place. The hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Where he's trying out the variations of, of, of Merry Christmas. It's so oddly endearing. And then in like this perfect instance of, ex- you know, exquisite, uh, timing the snowfall, you know, you start getting these magical snow globe flakes flurrying down and the score has the little, the mallet score going, you know, the very, um, vibraphone glockenspiel type thing or, or, um, music box sounds. And it almost makes you believe that Harry is in the middle of the holiday movie that he believes he is in. Like we almost believe it for a moment too, you know, and then the night shift comes out and they're like, who donated all this? And Harry responds with that just magisterial line. He goes, some people who didn't realize how generous they could be. And it's like, I feel like at that moment, it's like Harry can still be saved from the tragic ending. You know, it's like he's, yeah, he can, he can step back from that ledge. And that's what makes it so tragic is because you do feel so much for him. And it's, and, and again, with that and then the second Christmas party, they're just so magical. I think you're absolutely right that that's still the apex of him living in that moment, in that symbol, and yet not far gone enough where he's done anything uh, irreconcilable. And right. I think it's telling that he goes directly from there, I believe, to the Midnight Mass that's getting out, where he goes to see his boss, uh, and he wants to see him. And we never get that confrontation because the boss ends up kind of not sneaking out the back because he just doesn't even notice Harry. Um, uh, two things about that. One, I find it interesting. Uh, the boss is sitting next to his brother in church, isn't he? Oh. Uh, next to Harry's brother? I think that's... Um, or is that somebody else? Oh, he's just the new executive. Or is that the guy from the that he, from the office party? Yeah, Grosch. Grosch, okay. I think. That makes sense. He looks like he's got that John Cazale hair. <laughs> yes, that, yes. So at first I was like, wait, is that Philip? But there's no kids around him. So I do think you're right that that's, um, that's the executive that he had introduced to him i knew i knew you were supposed to know who it is but i for for some weird reason was like is that his brother I, but anyway you know the only reason i even noticed um and i didn't notice till the second time i saw it but i think it's because earlier at the office party there's a little little throwaway line of dialogue where he's like oh i'm taking gross to midnight mass uh you know oh, yeah. so i was like oh okay yeah yeah and so what i was gonna say is that a i i, I laugh that the uh the the boss can't stay awake during midnight mass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, B, though, it's very telling that Harry goes straight there after doing this good deed. Uh, almost like as if what he's doing when he gets there is that he's going to basically proudly declare what he did. You know what I mean? Like, like maybe he gets fired, maybe he does, whatever, but that's all his intent is, is to basically go share the news that good can be done, and he did it, and, you know, he did it all by himself and whatnot, and it's right. better than what they were going to come up with. And I think it's very telling that, um, particularly in the way the camera's placed on top of the stairs, looking down on him, that I, and like I said earlier, that he shows up to a religious place and all these people are on a slightly higher plane of existence than him because they have the quote unquote higher ground when it comes to Christmas and whatnot. Mm. And yet they're a bunch of assholes, not all of them, obviously, and no, not in real life, you know, whatever. But the first thing any of them do when they see a man dressed as Santa Claus with a bag of toys on Christmas Eve, this isn't like, yeah. you know, June 2nd or something. Right. Then they just start, like making fun of him and whatnot. And, and it just completely, it, it reminds Harry that he's fighting a war and he's the only one on his side. Yeah. And, and not only is he the only one, but the only one he could even uh, count on on his side are children. So it's never going to actually be one. So interesting. Uh, yeah, I found that interesting that, that 
the the first murders uh, that occur happen on the steps of a church in an almost very sacrilegious way. And I don't think, mm. and and that's why I feel like the closer you look into all of these events and whatnot, the more I just find it so funny that anyone would protest this as being anti Christmas. Um, however. I could understand why anybody who was religious could go watch this and basically feel like shit about themselves sure. uh, for various reasons. And I think that is often what people end up protesting in, in these kind of uh, situations. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's like we were saying earlier about, you know, people, they make the rest of us look bad. And so we're trying to find a way to, to knock them off the pedestal. I mean, God, you mentioned that shot. How about the shot at the end after he drives off and you have that image of all those churchgoers clumped together at the top of the stairs and they're staring at the two dead men and the one dead woman and there's this woman screaming hysterically it's like it just made me shudder both times i saw it i was like Ugh. yeah you know so yeah but yeah i I, th I think in a way you're right is that what it is is it makes them feel bad but but again it's i, I all harry's trying to do is he's just trying to be the person he was taught about as a child, you know, and there's this um, great quote from um, Truman Capote wrote a, a series of great Christmas short stories over the years. And one of the best is called jug of silver. And there was a quote in it. Uh, it's, it's glorious actually. Um, but I, I kept thinking about it when I was watching him doing the Merry Christmas outside the uh, Willow Springs. The quote is, he says, that kid is the most touching faith. It's a beautiful thing to see, but I'm beginning to despise this whole business. Hope of this kind is a cruel thing to give anybody, and I'm damn sorry I was ever a party to it. And ain't that like just the perfect way to describe Harry? I mean, as long as he's in that snow globe, if he's at, you know, at that moment, he's, you know, as happy as he's ever going to be, you know, as, as, as John Darniel would say, right? And it, it's, as long as that bubble stays unburst or that snow globe stays unsmashed, you know, because without the costume and the flurries, in in the music in in the snow globe it's he's just back to himself his sad-eyed self and it's i i can see how somebody would want to escape into that kind of delusion again it's like heavenly creatures where people are are uh, coping you know in a way so Absolutely. And I think on that note, we're going to break at the moment. Uh, when we come back, I think we'll lead off with the discussion on the relationship between Harry and Philip, uh, not Diana's children, but actually the characters in this movie. So uh, just wanted to make sure no one gets confused there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sit tight. Welcome back from the break, everybody. Uh, this is Project Exploitation. Of course, I'm Nick Cheney, and with me is Dan Jeremy Brooks, and we're talking Christmas Evil, a.k.a. That's also known as for you plebs. <laughs> you better watch out. 
Uh, so before the break, I said we were going to lead off with a discussion about the siblings here at the center of the film, uh, Harry and Philip. W- what I wanted to kind of open that topic with is by saying that the first time I watched this, I think I remember thinking uh, not so fondly of Philip. You know, sure. um, not that he was like a straight out, you know, like bad guy villain or whatever, but like wow, he's just an asshole, and yeah, Harry's a little weird or whatever, but you know, the more I rewatch it, the more I really think that what limited screen time uh, adult Philip has, uh, because it's not that many scenes, I mean, it's like three or four total, it's kind of weird how well I think uh, that actor pulls together a very convincing portrait of uh, basically a disappointed brother you know like that's where everything is stemming from it you know he's not actually angry so much as he's sad Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just manifesting in in these very unhealthy ways and i I find it to be so fascinating that when you when you really tie it all back to that opening scene and that's why like i mentioned earlier before the break i don't think of this movie as a psychosexual i saw mommy kissing santa claus i see this as this uh, the road not taken kind of, you know, two paths diverged that mm. night uh, between brothers and one got <laughs> how the world works immediately and the other, I wouldn't say didn't, but essentially refused to buy into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like said, no, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, but unfortunately, if that's how you feel and that's what you're thinking, that doesn't actually change the world around you. <laughs> And so for them to, you know, get off on that on that foot, so to speak, I, I really think it does reverberate through all of their interactions. I mean, the phone call they have uh, just before he shows up on his uh, doorstep is, is so great. It's, it, it reminds me of the scenes in movies in which uh, somebody is about to dramatically commit suicide. Yes. You know, where it's this kind of sense sense of finality where every word is being punctuated with an ellipsis mm-hmm. um, and the character is kind of uh, has reached a sense of acceptance, but the fact that they've reached some kind of acceptance is what's worrying, you know, to the audience, or in this case, to Philip on the other end of the phone. Um, but I like that Christmas Evil doesn't go in that literal direction. Uh, I think it's a similar mechanism as to what's happening, uh, you know, a sign of defeatism and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I find I find their, their relationship to be fascinating uh, and the kind of push and pull between, like you're saying, that Rockwell versus reality of one person who who knows how to, you know, knows the note to play the tune and the <laughs> other one who learned it maybe a little bit too late in life. Um, what, uh, what say you, Danith? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I totally got that vibe too. There is that feeling of finality. Like, when when somebody has settled on a on a decision, yeah, I, I almost um I don't know what I was what it reminded me of maybe like I don't know like J T Walsh in um A Few Good Men, you know the where he's writing you're hearing him write this letter or oh, and he's and he's putting on his uniform and he's you know and everything and then you know he kills himself. So yeah, I agree. It does have that worrying feeling, and in a sense, I mean he is he's not killing himself, but he's stepping away from any kind of attempt to integrate himself in life. And I think that's one of the most tragic things is that not just that he feels isolated because that in itself is, is it's horrible for anyone, but the fact that he is actually leaving behind people who do care for him very deeply, his, his brother, Philip and uh, his uh, sister-in-law. Um, oh, geez. What is her name? Jackie. Jackie, thank you. Sorry about that. But I mean, they, they grieve for him, you know, even, even before the end. And so in a way, he's not isolated as much as he thinks he is. And it makes the tragedy, I think, more acute. I mean, God, I love that absolutely wonderful, heartbreaking shot of Jackie sobbing into all the different mirrors. Yeah. Uh, there's like five of them. Apparently that was inspired, incidentally, by Douglas Sirk. So bring it up to Sirk again. Yeah. I mean, that shot, it tells you so much. And, 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 you know, speaking of acute, I mean, that conversation that Philip has with Jackie after he gets off the phone 
where he's I have it written here. Um, he describes he's always had to be the big brother. Yeah. And, he, and that really hit me hard. You know, he, he says at one point, he says, my brother is an emotional cripple and I'm his keeper. I'm responsible for everything he does. And you can understand that kind of resentment. I mean, it really struck me uh, really hard. I, w- I was uh, so in that way, I think maybe I did feel more sympathy um, even the first time I saw it for Philip, than than maybe you or most most folks would. Uh, but that said, yeah, it, it is sad. He feels an isolation that, in some ways, he's accidentally put on himself too. Which I understand. I mean, that's yeah. the problem with depression. Yeah. Well, it also what does it say that amidst all of this, amidst his delusions and his the the ascension he's taken into this uh, lore and whatnot, he does still reach out to Philip. Like, I feel like that in and of itself is a tell of that his humanity was never gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, it was being channeled into a, a very, unfortunately, bizarre uh, fixation. But if he was truly far gone, um, he never would have even called him. Like, you know, like if, if he thought that his brother didn't care about him or anything like that. It's the difference between feeling and knowing, right? Mm-hmm. And um, the, so the fact that he does call him and, of course, then shows up on his doorsteps, um, I think is still kind of what gives that whole finale the emotional heft that it needs to uh, get off the ground, so ah, to speak. Ah, yeah, yes. See what I did there? I do. So let's, let's, yes, yes. <laughs> let's talk about the finale. Um, sure. Did you know about the ending before it happened? I... Out of curiosity? I think I did, but I wasn't prepared for quite how good it was. I mean, according to Lewis Jackson, a great deal of the budget was spent on the effects for the end, that last couple shots. Right. But I mean, it is really nice. Yeah. I still think the ending is what makes this movie because after you sit down with Harry for, you know, 90 minutes or so and you follow his plight, I think the ending is a rebuke to the idea that this movie is quote unquote anti Christmas or that it looks down on Harry uh, for being fixated on Christmas. And in its own sick and twisted way, when I watch this movie, I genuinely take it literally. Mm. I mean, it's a surreal moment. Uh, and obviously, I know that the more accessible interpretation that comes to mind immediately upon watching it is that Harry is now so far gone that we the last few seconds are just quite literally his delusions being manifested in the celluloid of the movie that we're watching. But right. I don't know. Fuck it. It's Christmas, and I'm feeling charitable. So... When I see him, you know, in that uh, white, dirtied white van uh, take off, and I'm thinking maybe he's just finally being saved, and maybe this is actually, you know, he removed himself from the world, so <laughs> it, maybe he manifested this to happen. And and I think part of that's what I love about, for me at least, Christmas, is that those two things can be true at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like, the melancholy can basically threaten to eat you up at times. But then when the day comes and when push comes to shove, somehow you can still get out of bed and go downstairs yep. and have a day that's unlike any other. And and that's, for me at least, what, what that ending uh, makes me feel. Church. No, I'm, I'm with you all the way. I mean, you do talk about that uh, in that uh, letterbox review, by the way, which is very brilliant. And I did read it again, and it turns out it's still as good as I thought it was the first time. So, <laughs> so yes, uh, dear listeners, please do. Check out uh, Nick Cheney's review on Letterbox of Christmas Evil. It's quite, quite good. So, well, maybe I'll I'll throw a link to it. You should in the show notes. You should, but <laughs> well, it feels triumphant. And you're right. In a way, it could be just okay. He's he's so far gone. And you know, it's interesting because I, I've read a lot of interviews with Lewis Jackson over the years. And the earlier reviews, he's like, well, you see, he's getting more deluded. So the last few minutes are meant to be seen almost entirely from his delusion you know in like in the same way that you can hear him cracking the whip when he's in the van you can hear the sound of it even though it's clearly there's no sleigh bells or whips or reindeer he said that but now of course in the later interviews recent ones uh jackson's kind of like almost indulged i think in a little bit of retconning uh where he's like well it could be the whole thing is from his you know perspective and maybe we don't know if any of it's real which is something that's very de jour to say right now and something you and i i know 
have some qualification, some issues with, you know? So I don't think it's just a flat out guy goes nutso film, um, in that regard where we can't believe anything. Anyway, so I, I would say that I feel like, but it is very triumphant because it feels sort of like, you know, the end of breaking the waves or something where you've got the bells coming from heaven and you're like, Oh, wow. Turns out she was the one who wasn't crazy the whole time. Or, um, there's uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Safety Not Guaranteed, mm-hmm. uh, where at the end the guy basically does create the time yeah. machine. You know, I mean, it's spoiler. I, I was going to say the the Craigslist ad is real. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's well, something. It's not a spoiler. It's based on a real event. True, true. Yeah, that was where when the we first guy actually created the time machine. So. That's true. That was when we were able to finally start going back in time. I know it's funny. It's hard to believe there was ever a time that we couldn't time travel, you know, true. but there was a time people, you know, I remember being younger and not being able to travel around in time willy nilly. So anyway, yeah. but uh, yeah, so it, it does feel like that, which I, or, or like that uh, great Twilight Zone episode about the guy who's um, uh, he keeps going through that horrible nightmare of um him being executed every few days right yeah yeah you know what i mean i love that it's because the whole time that everybody's like well he's clearly deluded and then at the end you see everyone disappear and boom it starts up again and you're like holy shit this is maybe one of the worst things i can imagine (laughs) yeah (laughs) So, so it does feel that way where where in a way you know you're right he could be the delusion but it also could be like you know god is rewarding a man of great faith you know miracles occur you know if if you have faith to uh to move mountains if you will you know sometimes you can but you know that's one way to look at it i guess no yeah no i i that's how i look at it i um i guess let's move into just random thoughts you know just any other thing that we haven't covered individually one thing i want to shout out is the uh really dumb video that gets played at the office party (laughs) uh dumb in a good way like it is so perfectly made to be this weirdly unnecessary but also not very well produced self-congratulatory advertisement for i guess internal purposes like i don't really see that being like a public video like there's no real avenue where that video makes sense so yeah it's just a just a wonderfully weird slice of uh what the hell am i watching which is it, it makes perfect sense why a guy like Harry goes crazy. I mean, like when you surround yourself with that kind of uh, both stupidity, but also just low hanging fruit of pure self indulgence and crass, uh, you know, act of quote unquote pseudo giving. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's just a, it, I don't know. It's just a perfect distillation of the attitude that uh, the management has and, Anyone who's ever, I think, worked for anybody uh, can understand the feeling of watching that video. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Super self congr the, the, the kindness they have to themselves is extraordinary. Uh, and it, but, you know, I think that's, again, that's part of what makes Harry so sympathetic is that, you know, I mean, this is one of the many things that makes it different than your average slasher movie or, um, or even the, the more enduringly popular slashers. Um, those movies, uh, they have a, a generally an inscrutable villain um, whose motivations are totally, you know, they remain totally mystifying, which is part of what makes him so terrifying. But Harry's motivations are, ex- I mean, yeah, what he does is extreme, but his motivations are recognizable. And I think in that way, they're a little bit, they're relatable, dis- disquietingly relatable to us. And he has a code of conduct, you know, uh, <laughs> the code of Harry, if you will, and uh, a belief system. <laughs> Um, which justifies his killings as not immoral. And that makes him way closer kin, I think, to Travis Bickle than to Michael Myers all the way. Um, I mean, I, Taxi Driver does get mentioned a fair amount. And uh, when when people talk about this, people who've actually seen the movie and, and don't confuse it with Silent Night, Deadly Night or something like that. Yeah. Like people who have actually seen it realize it is not a slasher really at all. And it is much closer to it feels almost like a late entry in those those um great new Hollywood films, the late 60s and 70s, where you have the pronounced uh themes of uh, pronounced themes of isolation social isolation and obsessive surveillance and you know a character of slowly unraveling you know like uh like i said text driver or the conversation um, yeah i was gonna say the conversation oh right you know or um 
Uh, John G. Alvidson's the movie Joe with Peter Boyle. Um, Sidney Lumet had a movie called The Offense with Sean Connery. And, and, and actually, in fact, Todd Phillips' recent Joker is clearly trying to mine that same seam, you know? Ah. Now, whether you think it's as successful as, say, The King of Comedy. Ah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I didn't, I, I didn't dislike it as much as you, but I, I definitely, well, again, that's for another day. But yes, it is. Yes. Uh, Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're going to get into the tall grass a bit here. Okay. Uh, so uh, as Laura Dannon from Brick says, keep up with me now. <laughs> you know, stick with me here, buddy. Yeah. So this critic, Florent Cristal, has an essay in uh, a Christmas horror movie anthology book, Yuletide Terror. It's uh, published from Spectacular Optical, uh, which is very, very small kind of boutique type publishing place. They do very limited runs, but they're extremely deluxe. And Anyway, we will be sure to link to that. Uh, so in said essay, Cristal detects in Christmas Evil something that makes it sort of part of a trend in 70s and 80s cinema he calls the fool killer movie. So, uh, quote, he says, a new subgenre of horror films featuring bullied social outcasts avenging their persecution appeared on screens. Those titles included Willard, Horror High, Phantom of the Paradise, which I know, Nick, you are hugely a fan of. Oh, yeah. Uh, Carrie, uh, well, I mean, th- both of those are Brian De Palma right there. Uh, Massacre at Central High, Fade to Black, 976 Evil, and of course, Cristal mentions Taxi Driver and some of the new Hollywood cinema like I was just talking about. But anyway, he goes on to describe the full killer movie as uh, this. The victim slash murderer in these films belongs to the sociocultural category of the fool who is bullied or humiliated for being physically weak or too, quote, feminine, that is failing to meet the dominant masculine ideal and often comes from a poor working class background. So, again, you know, much, much like Harry here. Uh, yeah. And then Crystal again here. In other words, the fool represents the opposite of the cultural features traditionally valorized in mainstream American culture, strength, beauty, richness, success. As the main character of these films is a, quote, fool, but also a killer of, quote, fools in the looser and more moralistic sense of socially irresponsible people, I call him the fool killer and the name of the genre he evolves in the fool killer movie. Uh, so in this essay, Cristal ends up invoking a couple pretty old folktale figures slash traditions who have a lot in common with Harry, um, both philosophically and in the specific means that they deliver their idea, you know, their brand of justice. One of those folktale figures is the legend of Black Peter, which we'll get into in a second here. But the other is someone called the Fool Killer. Now, it's pretty likely that Cristal is bringing him up inadvertently because the Fool Killer is mostly unremembered today, but was a very well-known character in folktales and superstitions for a long time. Oh, in rural America. But whether Crystal meant to or not, I think Fool Killer and Black Peter for sure are super apt comparisons to make to Harry Stadling. Uh, it's kind of funny. The Fool Killer name actually goes back to at least the 1800s. Um, people would sometimes use it as an informal uh, term of endearment for the Almighty. Sometimes you'll still hear it now, but that's pretty archaic stuff. Right. Uh, also, in the late 1800s, there was this notorious daredevil who rode to Niagara Falls several times in a vehicle of his own invention. He affectionately called the Fool Killer. But there's already a superb podcast all about that one. That's called The Constant, which is done by Mark Chrysler. He's got this five-part series of episodes all about that original whole Fool Killer thing. Like, it represents an enormous amount of original research from Mark, and it's enormously entertaining to boot. So, yeah, seek that out. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. No. Nor are we here to talk about the Marvel Comics anti-hero that pops up every now and again since the 70s. No. We're not here, Nick, to talk about that. We're not here to talk about any of that, and we're definitely not going to talk about Judy. Uh, Which one are we talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, uh, no, we're talking about Jesse Holmes, the fool killer, who's this mythical figure, like sort of a Southerner's Paul Bunyan or a Pecos Bill or like, you know, the elderberry tree mother in Europe or whatever. Uh, first of all, I should say here that most of what I'm describing comes from the historical research of Edward Wozniak, uh, who writes something called the Balladeers blog, uh, to which we'll link, which is all about arcane and forgotten bits of Americana. He's written extensively, and I mean extensively on all this. So I'm paraphrasing him quite a bit. Here. Right. So Jesse Holmes, the fool killer, uh, was said to be this sort of picaresque wandering character who traveled around with a large cane with which he would clobber the supposedly monumentally hubristic and silly. 
Uh, and basically anyone who the teller of a given story believed was in need of a good, short, sharp whack on the head, you know, he's kind of, he's like the title character from the Beatles song, uh, Maxwell Silver Hammer, if you will. Anyway, and basically like most legends, it takes on a life of its own, passed down orally, et cetera. And he becomes this larger than life kind of tall tale who also doubled as, uh, like a, a conversational shorthand, like, you know, such as, you know, somebody would like, oh, it looks like, you know, that fella's about due for a visit from the fool killer you know, or something. Right. And this is true, by the way, well into the 20th century, where you have like master short story writers like oh, Henry and Stephen Vincent Benet, uh using Jesse Holmes, the fool killer in their work because he was such a familiar thing to the people, this supernatural being. Uh, oh, Henry in his story even compares the fool killer to Santa Claus in that excerpt we've got yeah. at the beginning of this episode. And also, I should I should take this moment to, just to give many, many, many thanks to the splendiferous and stupendous Sharon yeah. of the highly recommended Horse Talk Horror podcast. She's the co-host. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for lending her vocal skills to that intro right. section. I, I should say she is a big lover of the film Christmas Evil, by the way. And hesitated not at all to jump at the chance to yeah. uh, add her talents to our episode here. So thank you very so much, Lee, to Sharon. And she has her hands on all sorts of other intriguing projects now, too, uh, including a, a film she's producing with her husband, Spencer, who's also wonderful. So uh, much linking will commence uh, about all that. But anyway, so the idea of the mythical fool killer doling out rough justice is all over Christmas Evil, I think. I mean, even Lewis Jackson says the movie's basically meant to be seen as a tall tale. And then, of course, the other legendary folk character that Crystal compares Harry to is Black Peter, a.k.a. Krampus. Uh, are you... You're familiar with its uh, uh vaguely but uh remind me again oh sure uh well i mean okay yeah for, well for the uninitiated uh the legend goes naughty kids are scooped up into sacks by santa's helper black peter and spirited away where he kicks them like little sacks of potatoes basically um hell yeah I know, right? Well, yeah, this is like a European, but I mean, this is all over Europe. It's really weird. It's so metal. It is, dude. It's like, so it's not just that kids are getting coal. They're like literally being spirited away and they're like sold into slavery sometimes. I mean, it's really weird. Yeah, I don't understand why getting coal is such a bad thing. Like, that's a really, honestly, that's a hot commodity. Like, you know, like, True. you know how hard coal is to get? And how much it's valued at, depending on what processes you put it through. So mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, think about clean coal. I mean, people always talk about how valuable that is. So hell yeah, I, I would have loved to have gotten clean coal as a kid. I mean, it's it's a valuable fucking thing, you know. Uh, so, um, but yeah, yeah, there are a ton of correlations uh, b between Black Peter and Harry that I'm positive Jackson is invoking for us to see. You know, Jackson said he spent years studying everything he could get his hands on about the early roots in European legends of Santa slash Saint Nick slash Black Peter slash Krampus, etc. So things have got to be intentional in here. Uh, and some of this is super obvious. Like at Harry's place, there's this painting of Santa laughingly stuffing a kid into his bag. Yeah. And it's a very un-Rockwellian, but the painting style is very Rockwell. So it's like, it's this really weird, not Rockwell <laughs> thing he's doing. That is essentially a reference to Black Peter. Uh, Black Peter always dresses in fur, like a wild beast. Uh, he often has, um, darkened uh blackened skin and so it's like when harry's putting that mud i mean hello that scene outside of uh moss garcia's house where he's got the the mud on his face and he's smearing and then he's yeah I mean, he's basically looking for all the world like uh the homeless dude outside of winky's diner in the uh, mahon drive <laughs> you know where it's like yeah you know, <laughs> you know and then he's then he's leaving handprints on the house and that's exactly what black peter used to do he would mark the houses sort of like, like um calling card to santa like don't don't stop here uh-huh i took care of it boss yeah exactly or like he'll he'll mark it ahead of time so i'm like oh i just want to make sure i don't forget to steal away that child too because he's a bad and it, it, yeah, it's it's almost like um like blood on the doorposts, like the Israelites in the uh, Exodus, or you know something like that, but but in reverse, where it's not protecting, it's actually going to condemn you to you know. So and then later, obviously, Harry leaves that huge sack of dirt, like sort of like coal, on Moss's backyard, and then in Harry's shop, there's this creepy little uh monkey. He's a little hirsute fellow little helper that's hanging around he's he's he's, he's got a his is an evil laugh he seems like a big time 
Black Peter Krampus thing too. And then you were talking about um, the Laurel and Hardy film. Yeah. Uh, when the kids are watching that, the scene that um, we see is the one, the part in Babes in Toyland where an army of these sort of beastly oh, right. uh, pseudo Krampuses, right? Furry. Yeah, because they, they almost look like Sasquatches. They do. And the whole idea is this is part of another legend. I can't remember what part of Europe, but it's a, it's a variation on it. And the idea was they would come out of the forest and menace people who were not like charitable enough, like people who, yeah, who were not like kind enough at Christmas. So it's just, I feel like the movie's just chock a block with these Black Peter references. And it's strange because like, I don't know what you think about this. And this is maybe another thing that's just a tribute to, um, Brandon Maggard's performance. But he doesn't seem like really taking much pleasure in that. I mean, he enjoys being Santa Claus, but he's so like comical how stoic he is. Like when he's putting the sack of dirt there, like he's just, oh, I have a job to do. I take no special relish in this, but I have to punish the children. You know, it's like when he's making the list, he's so stone faced where he's cataloging each kid's little transgression, quote, transgressions into the bad boys and girls 1980 book. You know, it's like, <laughs> and, and of course, I, I mean, you know, like one of the things he writes down is like Moss Garcia crosses against the light. I'm like, Jesus, you know, that's a little harsh, you know, that that's enough to get you on census naughty list. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's, it, it, it's just weird. It's, it's like his performance. It's one of the, my favorite parts is he isn't like, you know, rubbing his hands together or twisting his mustache and going, ah, ha, ha, ha. he just seems like, well, I have to do this. It's, it's no fun for anyone, but I, I have to punish the children. You know, <laughs> it's uh-huh. just bizarre. Oh, and, and, and actually there's like another Black Peter thing too, which is that great scene in the, Christmas party, the second one, the really nice one. Um, he actually, there's a, he almost telegraphs, maybe not exactly, but pretty close to a tradition that they still do in some countries where they'll have Black Peter appear and, um, he'll arrive and offer the kids candy. And then as the kids come up to get them, he'll swing at them with his rod or walking stick, you know, a la the, say, fool killer, if you will. I don't know why he even does that. He's like, he's just trying to keep the kids alert or like teach them a, a lesson about, you know, the awful violence of all transactions. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, then he'll admonish them to be good. And then he gives them the candy and then the adults will ply him with booze. And that it's almost exactly how that scene plays out in the uh, family and friends association Christmas party. Uh, so, Anyway, there's a lot of ways I think that Harry is fulfilling that same basic role as as Black Peter or the Fool Killer. I mean, like even leaving aside their similarities of getting a little, you know, knife happy or bludgeon happy or foot happy or what have you. They're a lot like Harry in that they have this very severe and literal understanding of what justice is. And to those who they believe are deserving of justice, they are so over the top merciless, like darkly comically. So, yeah, it, it, you know, it's like what we were saying earlier uh, about, you know, telling kids there's no Santa. It's the same way that we, you know, we imbue kids with these morals of justice and that, oh, cheaters never prosper. And then later on, we tell them, well, hey, man, life's not fair. And I, kids, I, rightly, I think, say, well, hey, wait a minute, you just pulled the rug out from us. We really believed in all this idea of justice and fair play and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. So I think Harry's trying to do the same thing, uh, perform that same function that Black Peter and, and the Fool Killer did in rural Europe and uh, rural USA, respectively. They're kind of like stories of the boogeyman, you know? He does, the boogeyman does in fact serve a higher moral purpose. Like for adults, it's like, Hey, don't, don't get, you know, don't get so carried away with yourself that you lose touch with the reality or else the fool killer will come and lay you low. You know, it's basically about the idea of avoiding hubris or pride. And for kids, it's like, don't misbehave and be a trial to your parents or else black Peter will come and he'll stuff you in his death bag. And I think that actually leads to maybe my favorite single moment in the movie. I remember we talked about this a couple of days ago and it's, it's this conversation between the two detectives and it's almost all one shot. Yeah. Uh, it's very Aaron Sorkin esque, very walk and talk. And it's uh, Raymond J. Barry and Robert Lesser and the two policemen are chatting and they're Lesser's like, 
kind of holding forth on the origin of Santa Claus in America. And it's incredible how knowledgeable he is. It's like he's an amateur historian on these things, you know, <laughs> which in itself is hilarious. And then afterwards, uh, Raymond Barry's like, well, maybe our Santa psycho killer's doing some good after all. <laughs> And Lester's like, oh, you mean like give the myth back its meaning? He's like, no, myth, schmith, he'll make the kids scared again. <laughs> they won't think everything's coming to them so easy. If they're bad, Santa will get them. <laughs> it's just absolutely hysterical. Plus, of course, there's this brilliant thing happening in the background where you've got all the, the guys dressed up as Santa on the lineup. And they're all being exhorted to do Merry Christmas more with feeling, it, which, of course, reminded me of Bird with the Crystal Plumage, you know, bring out the perverts. <laughs> so that all just conspired to make that just maybe my favorite goo goofy aside, but it's so perfectly made. You can tell it was storyboarded because everything, almost all one shot, and it works so perfectly. And you've got the, the guys in the background. They're the Merry Christmas. All right, more feeling this time. Yeah. Yeah. No, right on. I think that's going to be a good note to go into final ratings. Yeah. Um, I'll start off. I'll... I'll, I'll reiterate what I've, what I've already said before, which is that I think it's a fantastic movie. Um, I think it's one that, for me, truly gets at the heart of the complexities of something like Christmas, which ends up being this larger-than-life thing, but it's also built upon a lie agreed upon. Yes. It's such a tenuous, you know, uh, fragile thing that any... You know, uh, any little disparate break in anybody's mental state, mine including, you know, can just have these huge ramifications. I mean, it quite literally dictates, speaking from personal experience, like, mm -hmm. it quite literally dictates my mental health for at least one month of a year, you know, and I feel like oh, yeah. that it had a larger effect most everybody's mental health, you know, whether it's just stress due to the shopping or, you know what I mean? So the idea that we're all kind of suffering, but also trying to overcome and actually do it all for a quote unquote purpose and for mm -hmm. a, a higher power, or at least a power higher than ourselves. Um, it can be, it can be something that is both beautiful, but also horrifying at the same time. And I think Lewis Jackson's Christmas evil, uh, truly, gets to the heart of that uh mostly besides obviously his direction mostly indebted to uh brandon magger's performance as harry in this i think it's a great performance i think he absolutely nails the um more banal moments where it's not really played too too high so to speak uh, but also uh, the, the creepier moments when he is kind of getting more and more lost into this uh lore and whatnot uh it, it's it's striking because it's so very much all of it is all stemming from the same performance but he is reaching completely different places uh on the emotional spectrum for each and, and that is it's pretty outstanding to watch so yeah for me this is a five-star film it's uh it's i mean co combining so much of what i love about things but also movies in general um i love that the movie at the end of the day takes christmas seriously um and and kind of ends on a note that says there's nothing wrong with that you know um at least in in my eyes obviously i'm not going to begrudge anyone for possibly interpreting that final scene uh <laughs> any which way because it's right there for you as far as um what it is most likely implying but uh, I think it's a little more malleable than that, and I think it's a little more complex than that. So, yeah, five stars from me uh, for Lewis Jackson's Christmas Evil. Uh, what about you, Dan? Nice. All, well, all the acting is is great in it, um, and all, all the supporting actors, like uh, uh, the guy who plays Grosh, uh, George Grosh. That's Peter Friedman, who I think of him always as the that really blandly like diabolical guru in Safe. You've seen that, right? Todd Haynes is safe. Where it, I think he's like one of the creepiest villains of the nineties. Yeah, he's up there with like Hannibal Lecter or, or Dwight Yoakam in Sling Blade. Or oh, something. that's right. I forgot. I, it's been a while since I've seen that, but yeah, that's that's him. Okay. Well, he's so mild. He's like he'll say these things that are just really not good, and you're like, that's really fucked up. But he says it so nice. He's like, well, he seems like such a sensible man, you know. And so I thought it was kind of funny that. In this movie, he's the one who actually finally sets Branton 
or uh, excuse me, the one who finally sets off Harry. He finally breaks the fourth wall and he says, Brandon, you got to cut this shit out. <laughs> Damn it, Brandon. You're not Santa Claus or Harry. Yes. Get a grip, sir. No, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that little slip up there, audience. Uh, and then, uh, also, did I tell you that the, uh, guy playing the accordion at the second Christmas party is none other than the late great Danny Federici from the E Street Band, Bruce Springsteen's organist of many years? You did not tell me that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, good old Phantom Dan. Uh, Bruce would sometimes introduce him as that for reasons that were never clear to me, but I have no idea how he became involved in the film. But I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So anyway, yeah, accordion playing by Danny Federici, the late great Danny Federici. And, you know, as we were saying, I mean, obviously, uh, <coughs> Brandon or Harry, whatever, Brandon Maggard's performance is really remarkable. And, you know, as, as you said, there's a lot of quieter moments. And I think this is one of the few movies I can think of where you've got like a score where it's so important to the plot. Cause like, for instance, you know, that time where he's getting ready for work and he's at the locker and he's looking in the mirror and this music starts kind of bubbling up this like really odd discordant synth and it just froths and then it ends and it goes back and it's like nothing's changed other than just micro changes in his expression. A lot of times you could, I mean, I love scores, they enhance films and I mean, I'm a big fan of music in general, of course, but Often you can say, well, you probably didn't need the score. The idea came across. But in this, it almost feels like Walter Murch-esque, like in um, uh, THX 1138 or, you know, uh, the conversation where the sound design and the score and everything is so essential to understanding the characters. And I, I so this is, I think, one of those really unusual instances where a score is really essential. It doesn't just enhance, but it, the plot wouldn't be as understandable, I think, without it. And and also there's times where like the score is going and he's like humming. Remember, I was saying that to you the other day where it, it feels like there's music that's clashing with itself. Like he's humming one thing and the score is doing something else and it's very discombobulating. <laughs> So between the score and, and Maggard's performance, it's it's a real two to force. It's kind of a shame because it seems like, you know, Maggard's kind of something of a jerk nowadays, sadly. Uh, yeah, I kind of got that vibe a little bit from the brief instance of the commentary I listened to, <laughs> where he seemed like he was only there because maybe he got paid to be there. I'm almost positive. And like... Jackson even says later to John Waters that Maggard doesn't approve of this movie morally anymore. And oh. anyway, but yeah, the guy just is just super passive aggressive. Like, oh, his commentary was like, I watched the whole thing and I don't know why I did because it was really annoying because it's so everything's just aha, uh -huh, ho, just all a big joke to him. He'll, he'll say shit like, oh boy, this guy's crazy or oh, this is very tense tension. Ooh. Or he'll say about the fans, he's like, all the fans of this movie, they're all weird. You know, at one point he pretends to fall asleep. It's just kind of a jerk. And yeah. Jackson will will say something and he'll be like, shut up, I'm trying to watch the movie, man. Uh, and, I'm, you know, and it's just like, in in truth, Lewis Jackson can get a bit pedantic. Um, but, you know, it's the only movie the guy ever did. And I, I, I sort of feel like we should always give a pass to first time filmmakers doing really verbose commentary, like Donnie Darko or something. It's like, you got to give everybody a pass on the first one, because this is the one where they're like, D did you notice I did this thing here? <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, so anyway, I'm not trying to shitbag Maggard too much, but it, it doesn't seem like. Well, it sounds like you are. Yeah, I guess I am. It's like, I'm not trying to shitbag him, but I don't know how to finish the sentence now. So <laughs> anyway, so anyway, I should just uh, finish this up here. Just say. I think first time I saw it, I was thinking four, and then second time four and a half. And um, as I've been reading more, I'm I'm I probably will go higher later. Moving on up, a deluxe moving on up to the North Pole. <laughs> right so on. yeah, mm -hmm. well, that concludes <laughs> our discussion. Uh, if I may, Dan, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> on Christmas Evil, directed by Lewis Jackson, uh, a wonderful movie out now. 
uh, on a beautiful Blu-ray disc uh, put out by Vinegar Syndrome. So uh, scoop that up. Uh, usually uh, this time of year, it's usually streaming somewhere, whether it's on Shutter or um, maybe even Arrow Player. I don't know where it's at right now, but it's usually not actually that hard to find thanks to uh, the curative efforts of Mr. John Waters uh, bringing it back into the spotlight. It so it is now time for... The A list. Story, the characters, the incidents are fictitious. The sicker and the period, the friend, and the other thing, and the very like blood. No, okay, sorry. Yes. <clears throat> All right. We are here in the A-list, and of course, this is the segment in which we take the B picture we just talked about and pair it with an A movie. Uh, thus the title. Thus the title. Yes. Thank you, Dan. That was extremely helpful. Okay. Um, just wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah. No. You, you, you nailed it. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start off. So for this one, ironically, I was going to do something that I've never done before. Um, which is apologize. No, uh, <laughs> I, God, I'm an asshole. No, I, um, <laughs> I, I was going to do something that I've never done, uh, on the A-list where I was actually going to recommend a double feature with a movie I don't like. Mm. Just based on the fact that I thought it actually does make a good double feature, whether I like the movie or not. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because it's Christmas, because I love Christmas. Uh, but I originally was going to go with what you had mentioned earlier was uh, with Joker. Ah. Because that is a movie that I, I I truly think something like Christmas Evil is a better uh, exploration of how uh, mental health can deteriorate in parallel with society itself deteriorating. The problem with Joker for me is the way it conflates the two as being a cause and effect. And therefore it almost sidesteps any actual, um, what do you call it? Uh, complacency on behalf of his protagonist mm -hmm. in their actions. And uh, it essentially tries to make you feel sympathy in the space that exists between their own, actions and their own culpability instead of allowing that to essentially uh be its own thing independent of the way society is you know acting and whatnot um not to mention that you know todd phillips just completely stacks the deck against the character to the point where yeah. it's just kind of boring like it's like it doesn't matter if he's got mental health issues or not uh in the script of Joker, because the entire world, for some reason, decided that he is the worst person alive before he becomes the Joker, which makes no sense. So anyway, that was originally going to be my game plan. Uh, but instead, I'm going to pair it with a movie that I actually like. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it in the Christmas wheelhouse. Uh, I am going to pair it with It's a Wonderful Life. Nice. So here's why. Um, I find them to have two very striking similarities that exist outside of Christmas, obviously, because uh, that's just a given. One of them is that there is a brotherly relationship at the emotional heart of both movies. Um, you know, like there's there is this moment in time in which the brothers went on two different paths based on a childhood moment that has affected them ever since. So I feel like that parallel in and of itself is kind of what drew me to it as far as like what clued me in on thinking like, oh, you know, it's got a weird tie in to It's a Wonderful Life. But then the other overarching one is that in a lot of ways, Christmas Evil is kind of the inverse of It's a Wonderful Life. They both deal with men who are kind of at their wits end uh, with regards to the state of the world, you know, around them. Definitely, and yeah. the seemingly uh, deterioration of kindness and compassion. And It's a Wonderful Life has the plot structure in which a higher power intervenes to allow the main character to reconnect with human beings mm. uh, and allow him to understand how human connections are important and whatnot. And here, if you take 
my interpretation of the ending, is almost the inverse in which a human being is at his wit's end and humanity is so shitty that a higher power decides to intervene and remove him from the equation because they don't deserve him. <laughs> yes, um, yes. And yes, that's a very liberal uh, interpretation. But I love it. Um, I, I found it to be just kind of a fascinating uh, funhouse mirror version of each other. And of course, you know, with both Yuletide uh, outings and whatnot. So, yeah, I think It's a Wonderful Life would be my choice. They're so, so different. But I also think that that's going to be almost... I think part of what makes Christmas Evil work is that you can't not watch it without thinking of how it stacks up against other Christmas movies. Because it is so very much a reaction to the fakeness of Christmas sometimes. And I'm not saying It's a Wonderful Life is fake or anything like that. Um but obviously, it kind of goes against the idea that, oh, sure, we pay for that kind of shit in our movies, but we don't practice what we preach in real life and whatnot. Uh, it's like the guy who cries at the end of It's a Wonderful Life still goes out and be an asshole 364 days a year, you know? Yeah, that's true. Um, so I, I find that to be fascinating. Um, I will say I like It's a Wonderful Life, but I also don't love it Ooh. like a lot of people do. Uh, there's This is just a really weird tangent, but... Go ahead. Um, I have a, a weird thing with certain uh, plot structures, and one of them is if you give me a narrative gimmick in which the narrative we watch is some kind of flashback, for some weird reason, my brain does not emotionally connect with it the same way I do if you are explicitly telling me that the action is present in the moment that we're watching it. So for some weird reason, whenever I watch It's a Wonderful Life, while I do love the ending, like the last 20 minutes or so, and it's a whopper and it really works, and frankly, the movie overall is good, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm, sure. I cannot get it out of my head that for the first, like, hour and 20 minutes, I'm like, why are we watching Clarence do his homework? Like, <laughs> why are we not watching the movie instead? And I totally, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but there's something weird about the entire angle in which it's almost like the movie doesn't start until there's 30 minutes left to go. Not because what you saw is not important, but it's structured as being something that is just this thing that uh, the angel has to watch and then comment on. Um, anyway, just hmm. a weird, it's a, it's a weird pet peeve of mine that is completely irrational and, uh, you know, my own neuroses or whatever. But I always find it funny whenever we watch it that I forget just how long it is before we watch anything that is like, actually a kid like contemporaneous <laughs> yeah like like okay this is happening and this is important because we're explicitly told up front that everything we've seen is just a thing that could have probably just been said in a conversation you know what i mean it's not like we glean anything from it that wouldn't have been just quote-unquote words exchanged so in that case it's like why not watch it that way like contemporaneously and then all of a sudden the angels appear you know, it, but anyway, uh, it's, uh, that's interesting. It's just a weird uh, thing of mine. It's kind of like when, um, and I like these, but when Martin Scorsese gangster movies have to be told in the future for no real reason. <laughs> yes. And now I know it's not really the future. It's usually kind of more of an omnipresent type narration. But yeah, in Casino, thing, it gets really thorny because um, you, you realize near the end that uh, Joe Pesci's character. You assumed it was set after the film. He's telling the story, but it's not because he's killed. It's very interesting. Anyway, sorry, but yeah, yeah, but I know it's right. Mean. He's like a ghost, and yeah, yeah. And it's one of those weird things where now what saves those movies that the writing and the narration is actually really good. So it's more about the flavor of the you know whatever. But whenever I'm told a character is about to tell me a story, I'm like, no, 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 just roll the movie. <laughs> like, right. Uh, anyway, it's just like I, I'm not a. It's, that's why the Princess Bride sucks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but that frame story is only like a couple scenes. I mean, it's just the very beginning. Of, yeah. Anyway, all right, fine. Well, I love Princess Bride, and I love uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I mean, probably, probably my favorite Christmas film. Even though, as you pointed out, like only the last thirty minutes or forty minutes or whatever is set in Christmas. So, uh, you know, which is kind of interesting. But um, no, I, I actually I have to admit I I don't agree. Um, in the sense that I do think the frame story is actually very clever. Um. But I, I do understand to an extent kind of what you mean about it does all feel like prelude. It is a weirdly structured movie in that way. In that sense, I don't, 
I mean, I'm sure there's other films of that style. I don't know how many prior to that were like that. You know, I mean, obviously there were, there were flashback films. I mean, Citizen Kane's you know, oh, right. one of the famous ones. I but- will say that A, it is, uh, it was very much ahead of its time. Mm. And B, that I'm not against the idea of the structure in and of itself, but there's something about that movie in particular. And you just said the word prelude, and I think that that's exactly it, where there's something that's underlining the whole part of it to feel like a prelude instead of uh, feel like these two characters are really getting involved with what they're seeing. I mean, they're commenting on it for sure, but it's almost like continuing to cut back to them is taking me out of actually emotionally consistently putting myself in George Bailey's shoes. I, I don't know, like I said, it's a pet peeve. It's not an actual thing that's actually against the movie itself. It's it's just something weird that I notice every time I sit down to watch it. It's like, God, this movie doesn't start for like an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> well, you're right. It does feel like a, a long prelude. Um, you're like, well, I, but hold on. I got to show you one more thing and then you'll finally understand Mr. Bailey. <laughs> Right. It's it's just like me. I'm like, I got to tell you about Black Peter now, and you're going to have to listen, God damn it! You're going to sit there, and you're going to lit. But yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, so yes, you're Clarence, and I'm St. Peter, I guess, you know, which, hey, I mean, not the worst things to be compared to. You know? That's true, and I'm just sitting here going like, I got to listen to this shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, Clarence is like, all right, yeah, 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 get to the end. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm good. We, yeah, the guy's about to jump off a bridge. I need to do this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we don't have more time. Oh, be gone. Oh, yeah. Good job, God. Yeah, nice. Man, God is a fucking lunatic. <laughs> it's like that, um, oh, geez. Oh, I cannot think of her name right now. Dang it. Please. She's in one Mississippi. She does that show. Tignataro. Thank you. Tignataro. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She basically got cancer. Her mother died and her, uh, companion broke up with her all in one year. Uh, and she survived cancer. But anyway, there's a point. She has this part near the end of, um, her routine about all that. Where she says, you know, they always say, well, God, he just, he only gives you enough, you know, just, just enough that you can handle. She's like, I don't know. Feels like he gave me a lot that year. You know, she's she's imagining the angels are up there with God and God's like, okay, well, let's give her a little more. And the angel's like, wait, God, God, stop. What are you doing? That's too much. He's he's like, no, I think, I think she can handle a little more. And the angel's like, no, God, this is too much already. (laughs) And then like the angels are walking away and they're like, God is a fucking lunatic. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I'm sorry. That was a really long tangent. (laughs) Anyway. We expect nothing less from you. Yes, I'll probably cut most of that because damn. So, (laughs) but uh, I love, I love your idea, by the way, of It's a Wonderful Life. That is a great choice. It is very much a fun house mirror. uh, Those two films. That's really a good choice. Well, what do you got for us? Well, I struggled a a lot with this one. Um, And, um, in the end, I chose something that's not Christmas related. I don't think there might be a Christmas element to it, but it's kind of secondhand if it is. I, I haven't seen it in a while, but, um, I'm recommending a movie by, it was written directed by David Jacobson. It was one of the only films he's done. Uh, and it's called Dahmer from 2002. Um, this is not to be confused with my friend Dahmer or raising Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, neither of which of those films I have seen, but this was the first thing I ever saw Jeremy Renner in. And it's still one of his best turns. I, I was like, who is this guy? Because he was basically an unknown at the time. And it came out in the early aughts with like a slew of other serial killer biopics that were all released at the same time. They were all by the same company, um, Alchemy, Millennium, something. And they all were packaged very similar. And this is, you know, video rental still existed. So it was early aughts. And so you'd see them, they put these out on the release wall and you was like Ed Gein, Gacy, Ted Bundy. I think there was like a Night Stalker one, Hillside Strangler. And it was always like a picture of their face. It was very, very over the top, hyperbolized, very much exploitation in the worst sense. You know what I mean? And most of them were, like I said, not very good. But apparently, uh, David Jacobson did not get the note that he was supposed to just do something stupid because he wrote and directed this amazing film with a really great quality. I have no idea how accurate or fictionalized it is compared to the actual life of Jeffrey Dahmer, but it's, it's powerful. And there is actually very little violence. It's a lot like Christmas Evil in the sense that there is almost no violence in the first hour or so, but just bucket loads of dread just this feeling of dread and it's it's very much in keeping with those movies we were talking about earlier 
the movies with isolation and social disconnection, like Taxi Driver and, you know, Fade to Black and Joe and the King of Comedy and, you know, to an extent Joker. But I think it's more sensitive in its depiction than even those movies, even though I love Taxi Driver and King of Comedy. I think this is actually a little more restraint, which is odd considering the subject matter is so horrifying and over the top, just in the reality of it to begin with. Uh, and, and also he works at a chocolate factory. Uh, and so these scenes of the monotony of him on the assembly line, when I was watching Christmas evil, I kept thinking about those soul, those soul deadeningly prosaic shots of Dahmer at the chocolate factory. And I think in the end, that's what made me first really think of it. So I'm recommending Dahmer, uh, David Jacobson wrote and directed one of his only films. Um, I don't know what has happened to him, but it's a wonderful film and I believe it is available most places. Right on. Uh, similar to Lewis Jackson, obviously, who unfortunately did not either want to make or get to make. Probably a little bit of both <laughs> um, after that experience. Uh, another film after Christmas Evil. Well, there you have it. Those are our picks for the A-list for this week. So, uh, yeah, I think that's about wraps it up. Uh, we got to go uh, wrap up some gifts and uh, put them under the tree. Uh, but uh, to uh, to all of you out there who uh, celebrate in any which way or don't. Uh, have a great rest of your year, and uh, happy holidays from myself, Nick Cheney, and my partner in crime, my little Rudolph. <laughs> oh, look at that red nose glow. <laughs> Dan Jeremy Brooks. Listen, you don't have a right to say that. that that's, that's our word, red nose. Oh. Sorry, go on. Sorry. <laughs> It's like I hit a button there. Uh, <laughs> like a red button? Oh, my God. Red, shiny button? From all of us. And maybe starting next episode from just me. <laughs> and <laughs> exploitation. <laughs> Have a great one. Uh, keep on reeling. It just needs an end, Max. I... I don't have an end.